Right, so let's uh, continue on with our discussion of uniform circular motion. Uh, today is going to be a little bit different uh, because we missed a day uh, of lecture. This will be a little bit longer recording, uh, but that's okay. I think this is going to be beneficial to you. Uh, I'm going to spend most of the time today talking about just how to do some problems. I got a bunch of sample problems I want to work through and show you kind of how to work these because as you probably noticed doing the homework, uh, this is the point where things start to get a little bit more interesting and a little more challenging. Uh, so the kitty up here is demonstrating exactly what uh, what we've been talking about, uniform circular motion. So we've probably all seen cats or something do this kind of thing. And I want you to notice something as you look at this image. Uh, as this cat runs in the circle, notice that he kind of has to lean towards the center as he runs. Uh, this is a result of the centripetal acceleration and the centripetal force that we see in these uniform circular motion problems. Uh, you've also got up in the top right corner, his brother is kind of watching him, wondering what the hell he's doing, which is a common occurrence if you have cats. So enough kitties. Let's go to the whiteboard. So what we're going to be talking about are these uniform circular motion problems. And when I say uniform circular motion, let's take a moment to review that and make sure that we understand what these kind of problems are. So typically for a uniform circular motion problem, we're gonna need a circle, obviously, because it's not called uniform square motion or triangle motion or hyperbole motion. Uh, it's called uniform circular motion. Again, I'm a physicist, not an artist. So let's assume that this is a circle, right? Perfect circle. And generally when we talk about circles, we use a measurement of the radius. So if we pick an origin in the center of the circle and we draw a line out to the edge of the circle, that's the radius. Now I can measure several different radii. So we'll call that R1. But let's say that I was interested in something happening at kind of this distance away, we're going to do the same equations. That's going to be a different radius. I'll call that one R2. So nothing really changes here uh, as far as the motion, but the forces are going to be a little different. And let's think about how that works. We're effectively going to have one speed that's going to be our angular velocity. And remember, we talked about that as being omega. So that's our angular velocity. Generally, our angular velocity is going to be a function of this angle theta, which is however far this went, right? And so remember, we're going to call that arc length S. And anytime we're talking about a velocity, in general, Velocity is distance per time. We learned that in chapter one. The distance we're talking about here for the angular velocity is this S. So we'll call that delta S for some time. Now the time, remember, just like everything else is largely arbitrary where we start and stop. It's our stopwatch. We can start and stop whatever time we like. 
So we're generally going to say that our initial time is zero, and then the time it took is some time t. So our angular velocity is going to be some delta s over t. Remember how you find s. is a function of r and theta. And that comes from the right triangle stuff. So we have an angular velocity for this system. Just like everything else, you may see positive and negatives here. We can arbitrarily pick our directions. So in this case, I'm just going to arbitrarily say that Counterclockwise is the positive direction, and clockwise is the negative direction. You could do it the other way if you want. It doesn't matter as long as you're keeping all of your uh, all of your signs the same. Because when we're talking about a change of distance, generally these velocities are magnitudes. We don't normally worry too much about if it's the left or right. That's what your signs do for you. So in this case, because we're talking about angular velocities, when we come out with positive and negative, we're talking about direction of rotation, not necessarily the north-south kind of thing. However, we will notice that even though we have angular velocities, we also have what are called tangential velocities associated with this motion. We'll call those B. So those tangential velocities are going to be different. While the angular velocity is going to be a constant no matter where you are. So think about this, just like we talked about before. Imagine a record player. Those of you who are old enough to remember what record players are and what records look like. We measured the speed of rotation in RPMs or revolutions per minute. Uh, so records would have 45 and uh, 77, 33 and a third, 75s. Uh, and that's a measure of revolution per minute. So it doesn't matter where you are on this record. If you pick a point and follow that all the way around, and every time it goes around, you count, and you do that for a minute, you're going to get the same value whether you measure it here towards the center, or here towards the outside. That is your angular velocity. However, if you were to, let's say, put some kind of marble or something, or a rock, onto various points on this thing, and we start rotating, at some point, that centrifugal force that we generate is going to force that rock to leave the record, and it's going to leave in a straight line. It's not going to maintain a curve. So that's going to be our tangential velocity. So these are going to be different. And these are the kind of problems that we're going to look at today. So the reason I wanted to recover that is because I want you to recognize exactly what we're dealing with for these kind of problems. Uh, let me, first of all, write some useful formulas that we're going to need here. So we already know that in general, velocity is distance per time. We know our angular velocity is or delta S over T. We know that 
in general, acceleration is velocity per time. But we have a new thing that's angular acceleration. And that is the square of the velocity over the radius. This is going to be interesting for us, and this is what we're going to look at. I think there's a homework problem that asks you to do something similar to this. Uh, the trick is that it's got this square in it. So if you forget the square, then you're going to end up with the wrong answer. So be careful with that. This is why I always recommend that you try to solve these problems symbolically uh, before you start trying to plug numbers into it. So why is this acceleration, the centripetal acceleration, interesting? Well, if we remember, all of this, since a few chapters ago, has been about Newton's second law. Newton's second law says that the sum of all the forces, just to be correct, the sum of all the forces, is the total mass of the system times the total acceleration of the system. Up until now, we've been worried about linear acceleration. We've been worried about things going in a straight line. So our acceleration has simply been dvdt. However, we now have to worry about rotational forces. Rotational forces are going to be different going to get these centripetal forces. So if we use Newton's second law here, we're going to come up with this rotating force, centripetal force. So Newton's second law tells me that the sum of these forces has to be the mass of the system. In all of these cases, the mass is not going to change. And we're not worrying about some rotating disk that's somehow gaining or losing mass as it spins. We're also not going to worry about a rotating disk that might have different weight distribution. For example, uh, if I have a dinner plate and on the dinner plate I have I don't know, a hunk of meat, a hunk of wheat. Uh, now, I start spinning this. This side is going to be heavier than this side. And so what's going to happen to this thing is it's going to kind of wobble uh, as it spins around. This is a much, much more difficult problem to deal with. We're not worried about that. We're talking about uniform density circular points. This is kind of the spherical cow in a vacuum approach. So the mass is not going to change, but the acceleration is going to be different. The acceleration we're worried about here is actually the centripetal acceleration. So we can substitute in a v squared over r. So now we have our linear force and we have our centripetal force. So this is where we're going to start. So first problem. So let's say I've got a circular track. And I know it has a radius of 18 centimeters. And I know that it has a constant velocity of six meters per second. That's my angular velocity. So what I want to do
is I want to find the magnitude and direction of the acceleration of the object. Since we're moving in a circle, we need the centripetal acceleration. Well, this is actually pretty easy to do. Colors. We want to find centripetal acceleration. So that's our A sub C we want to find. We have an equation for A sub C, which is just V squared over R. Now in this case, our V and our omega are basically the same. That's all we've been given. So we just plug numbers in. Our V in this case was six, so remember the square. And our radius is 18 centimeters. So awesome. Be careful with this problem. Don't do this. If you put six squared over 18, you're gonna get the wrong answer. Why? Because remember, this is in centimeters. Everything we do with these physics problems needs to be in standard units. So we need this to be in meters. So as an aside, remember that I can't write. Unit conversion, 18 centimeters is the same thing as 0.18 meters or 0 0.18. So let's not forget our decimal. And when you work this out, this works out to be 50 meters per second squared. Let's make sure that we understand that this is right. This is an acceleration. Acceleration should work out to be velocity per time. Well, in this case, we have an expression that gives us an acceleration in the square of velocity per distance. So that's a little non-standard. So let's make sure that we understand that this is the correct answer. So we can do that with a little bit of dimensional analysis. If we know that acceleration is velocity per time, and velocity is distance per time, and radius, is just a distance, then we can do some simple substitutions here. And we can say that centripetal acceleration is velocity squared. That's the same thing as distance over time squared, divided by the radius, which we know is a distance. So that gives me a d squared over t squared, divided by D, one of the D's cancels, and that leaves me with a D over T squared over one. That one is effectively useless. So this works out to be a distance per time squared. It's exactly what we get, the distance per time squared because our distance was given to us in meters and our time was given to us in seconds, we should expect something that looks like meters per second squared. And that's exactly what we get. Let's make sure 50 meters per second squared is a reasonable estimate. Well, we could 
just we can just make some kind of routine thought experiments here as r gets really big remember i talked about this last time the the concept of an equation or a problem where i might say assume exceptionally large or exceptionally small r so let's see what happens as r gets really really big and omega is really really small so how quickly is the outer edge of this plate going to increase speed i would expect the further away i am from the center the longer it's going to take to accelerate so we're going to have a very low acceleration back well if we take a look at our centripetal acceleration, we get a V squared over R. If we let R get really big, we've got some value, V squared, whatever it is, but it's over something exceptionally large. So any number divided by something much, much larger than itself is going to go to zero. So it's never going to be absolutely zero. But we're going to get something really, really, really small. So as R gets big, our centripetal acceleration gets really small. We would expect the opposite if R gets really small. So as R goes to zero, instead of going to infinity, we get some number divided by 0 0.00001. AC gets really, really big. So this is the problem with the cat earlier, right? The cat's running in a circle. The tighter that circle becomes, the more force he experiences. Why does he experience more force? Because force is a function of acceleration. And in this case, our triple acceleration is a function of velocity and radius. And it is inversely proportional to the radius, as we would expect. So as R gets big, we expect A to get small. As R gets small, we expect A to get big. Does this seem reasonable? Sure. Six meters per second. Six meters is roughly 20 feet, thereabouts. You can, for estimation purposes, a meter is about three feet. It's a little bit more. Uh, but for estimation purposes, three. So six times three gives me 18. I know a meter's a little bit bigger, so eh, about 20 feet. And uh, so that's about 20 feet per second that it's moving. So that's pretty quick. And our radius is 18 centimeters. Well, think about how small that is. Uh, that's 0.18 meters. So that's about, what, a quarter of a meter. Uh, so three divided by four. <laughs> hmm, that's something less than a foot. So let's call it 10 inches. So we've got something that's roughly 20 feet per second going around a circle that's about 10 inches in radius. So we get something like 50 meters per second for the, or 50 meters per second squared is the acceleration. That's reasonable. Let's think about this in terms of what we call Gs. A lot of times you'll hear this term, uh, especially in aviation and space travel, you'll talk about pulling Gs. Somebody's on a nine G term where you experience a force of four Gs at launch on the second five. One G, this is just a, a unit. So one G, that's the acceleration due to gravity. That's our 9.81 meters per second squared. So if you want to know how many Gs of acceleration, you take your meters per second squared value divided by 9.81 to do a unit conversion, right? 
So this works out to be a little less than five Gs. So if you're in this circle, you are gonna experience an outward acceleration. It is gonna feel like to you that you are under five, roughly five times as much force as you are just standing on the earth. So if you imagine, let's say I weigh 270 pounds, and I'm standing on the earth under one G, I weigh about 270 pounds. But if I undergo an acceleration of five times that amount, then suddenly I weigh 270 times five. So that's around 1,200 pounds. Suddenly gets really hard for me to walk around, right? This is one of the problems with sustained high velocity flight. It's a problem with sustained acceleration in a spacecraft because your Mark I body is not built uh, for conditions that are much of a deviation from 1G. So even if you're in a spacecraft and you're in going 2Gs of acceleration, or even one and a half, that's not, doesn't feel terribly bad, but remember your heart, your lungs, your muscles, your bones, all of that is built for a 1G environment. So if you put an extra 50% of weight on top of that, that system's going to break quicker over time. So this is why we continually, as uh, rocket scientists and spaceflight engineers, we try to minimize the accelerations in terms of Gs. And so you'll notice, as I talked about before, this is kind of the rotating spacecraft problem is we want to balance those. So we now want to know the net force that acts on this object. So that was part A. So part B. Find the net force on this object. Well, this is not very hard to do. So what we're going to say here is we know we're looking for a force. So anytime we need a force, start with Newton's second law. F equals ma. This is going to be a centrifugal force. No, well, we need to know the mass. M. And we need the acceleration in this case. It's the centripetal acceleration. So mass, the, we know the centripetal acceleration is V squared over R. And let's say for the sake of argument that whatever this is out here weighs five kilograms. So that's our mass. So if C equals five times V squared over R, we already calculated V squared over R, right? So we know that's 50 meters per second. So we get five kilograms times 50 meters per second squared. So the math on that is pretty easy to work out. It's 250 Newtons. Again, remember it's a force, so we write it in Newtons. Newtons, if you remember your scientific units, is kilogram meter per second squared. So we get something like kilograms times meters divided by second squared, kilogram meter per second squared. That checks to be the unit of a Newton. And what we're left over with is the scalar of 250. So that's 250 Newtons of force that we're seeing. Now, what direction does that force act in? That's a little interesting. Remember, 
the centripetal acceleration, let's draw some vectors here. The centripetal acceleration is going to act towards the center of the circle. So our centripetal force has got to do that as well, right? Because mass doesn't have a direction associated with it. The acceleration does. We only know about the one direction of the acceleration, so the force must act in the same direction. So our centripetal force, our centripetal force is directed towards the center of the circle. Cool. Well, why is that useful to me? Imagine that I have a rock on a string and I swing the rock in a circle. I'm going to generate a centrifugal force towards the center, but E1 opposite reaction, right? <clears throat> There's going to be a force acting exactly opposite of that. That should look like the tension in my string, right? So if I want to spin this rock at a given velocity, then I know how much tension the string should be able to take. Then it becomes an engineering problem. There's some called Young's modulus that talks about the ratio of stress versus strain. It basically tells you when something's going to break and how much force. So we want to make sure that we have something that has tension <clears throat> that's at least equal, if not greater than, the maximum centrifugal force we're going to encounter. So, pretty easy. Let's do something a little different. Well, not too much different, but perhaps a little more fun, at least in setup of the problem. Uniform circular motion again. So now what we have is merry-go-round on the playground. And the merry-go-round is going around at three meters per second. So not very fast. And we take some kid and we say that kid weighs 25 kilograms. And we're going to position him at a distance of roughly three meters from the center of the merry So we've probably all done this at some point in our lives on the playground, right? Where you stand on the merry-go-round and you have your friends, assuming you have any, unlike me, I was a nerd kid in the 70s. We didn't have friends. Uh, so you get a friend to, for six to spin you, right? And the faster they spin you, the harder it is to stay. And eventually you're going to fly off the thing. So what we want to know is we want to start working that problem out, right? So let's find out what is the centripetal acceleration on this kit. Well, that's easy. Centripetal acceleration is just V squared over R. We know our velocity is three meters per second. We get the square. Our radius is three meters. Uh, so remember, we need this in meters. So we're good to go there. Just plug in at three meters, right? No unit conversion required. So what does that work out to be? You get something that looks like three squared, which is nine. And three, nine divided by three. That's just three meters per second squared. 
That's our centripetal acceleration. Not a big deal. Let's find the centripetal acceleration or the centripetal force. So how much force is there pulling this kid towards the center? Well, we know that FC is equal to MA, A sub C, really. Well, we know the mass, we said the mass was 25 kilograms. And our centripetal acceleration we just found is three meters per second squared. And so if you work that out, that's 75 newtons of force. But for the last part, let's do something different. We want to compare this to the weight of this kid. In other words, we want something that looks like centripetal force divided by weight. Well, we already know what centripetal force is. That's 75 Newtons, right? Weight, remember, Weight is just a special case of force, mg. We know the mass is 25, and we know that g is 9.81. Just to make the math easy, let's call it 10. So that would end up being 250. And that gives you about 0 0.3 newtons is, uh, is, is the ratio of the centripetal force to the weight. So the centripetal force is about 30% of what he weighs. That's interesting. So why would that be interesting to me? If I know how much he weighs, and I know the coefficient of friction between the kid and the merry-go-round, I can find out the normal force, right? because normal force is mu n, uh, or, well, mu w. So, the heavier the kid is, the lower this value gets, right? The lower the ratio is. Or, another way to think of it is, the faster we spin this, and the more centripetal force there is, in other words, F C gets big, this ratio gets really big. And suddenly you can't, and suddenly you don't have enough frictional force, mu n, to counter the centripetal force. So we're going flying, right? So that might be an interesting homework problem that you might see is what is the velocity at which the kid gets yeeted? I'll leave that for you to play with on your own. The velocity of the yeet, piece of yeet. So, let me find another good problem. So, so far, not too bad, right? Notice that these are all just repeated applications of the same thing. I printed out a ton of these today because I'm lazy and I don't feel like making things up on the fly where the numbers might not work. But if this is useful to you, and you want more problems like this, uh, all I did was look for uh, 
uniform acceler uniform circular acceleration problems with solutions. And it printed me out this probably 50 pages uh, on this website. So let's do one a little different. So here we've got some particle in uniform circular motion. And we know the radius of this thing is three centimeters. And we know that the force acting on this object is 30 newtons. And we know the mass of this thing is six kilograms. Let's find centripetal acceleration. Well, that's pretty easy to do. So centripetal acceleration is just V squared over R. We know what our V is, um, or do we? Oh, we don't. Well, we can find it. We don't know what V is. So we're screwed, right? Just give up. Yeah. There's a way to find this. It just requires us to be a little bit clever and apply what we've learned. Now, what's something else that we know? We know that our centripetal force is mv squared over r. Well, we need to find v. So actually, just to make this clear what I'm doing, We know that our centrifugal force is the mass of the thing times the centrifugal acceleration, so m a sub c. We can make a substitution m a sub c. Well, a sub c I know is v squared over r. Well, remember, what am I trying to find? trying to find the centrifugal acceleration. So I really didn't even need this piece yet, right? Because I just want to know what AC is. Well, this is pretty easy, right? I know what the force is. That was given to me. It's 30 newtons. So now I can just start plugging some numbers in. I get 30 newtons. I need a mass. Well, I was given that. Six kilograms. And that has to be multiplied by whatever centripetal acceleration is, right? A sub C. So do a little bit of algebra here. And we get that the centripetal acceleration is five meters per second squared. Cool. Well, now what, I, what if I want to know V, right? So this is part A. Part B. Find our linear velocity. Well, we know that A sub C is B squared over R. Suddenly, this is trivial, right? I know what AC is. Five meters per second squared. I want to find V. Don't forget the square. And I know what R is. That's three. Uh, three meters. So, I'll drop the 
uh, units for now, just to make this a little bit easier to do. So what we're gonna get is this works out to be 15 equals V squared. Don't forget the square. We have to get rid of that so we need a square root. So B is gonna be root 15. Whoops. Forgot it's in centimeters. I need it in meters, so that's 0.03. So that gives me 0.15. So root of 0.15 is whatever that works out to be. I don't care if you leave it like that, but on the computer, when you do this online, you've got access to it, and it's going to ask you to calculate this. You can cram that in your calculator pretty easily, find out what it is. Next part of this. We're going to assume that we radiate, we double the radius. Let's find how the acceleration changes. All right. You could do this by plugging in the numbers and work it again. But let's see if we can be a little more clever. We know that centripetal acceleration is just V squared over R. So that means that the centripetal acceleration is proportional to the inverse of the radius. So you may not have seen this symbol, this little alpha little thing. This means proportional. So that means that the centripetal acceleration is gonna change with the inverse of the radius. And this is what we were just talking about. As R gets big, AC gets small. So they do the opposite of each other. That's what the one over is. Well, then that means that since that is true, we can set up a fraction. Let's get two different accelerations, one called a sub C, that's our reference frame. And another one called A prime of C, that's our new reference frame. Well, since we know that the R is inversely proportional, then A sub C has got to be inversely proportional to R. A prime of C has got to be inversely proportional to something called R prime. Remember, just look down opposite sides of the fraction. Well, I know what A sub C is. That's five. What I'm trying to find is really this A prime of C, right? This is my new reference frame because I've got a different R. So A prime of C, R prime, remember, is the same thing as 2R, right? Because I said I'm going to double the radius. So our new R prime is just going to be 2R. Well, that's interesting. 
you could plug numbers in, right? We know what the R is, 0.03 meters, but look, 2R over R, one of the R's goes away. And we're left with five over AC prime is just two. A little bit of algebra, and we'll find that AC prime is two and a half meters per second squared. That checks with what we expect, right? If the radius doubles because of this, if R doubles, we expect the centripetal acceleration to decrease by a factor of a half. So if our initial AC was five, and I double the radius, half of five is two and a half. And that's exactly what worked out here. Why does that work? Because of this cancellation right here. Notice that we don't care about the B squared in this case. Why? Why do I not care about the B squared? It's because of the way the problem was set up. We said early on when we established the problem that these are all going to be uniform circular motion. So our velocity of this spin is not changing at all. This is just our V sub R, our V squared sub R. Since the V squared is a constant, doesn't really matter what it is, right? It's not changing. This is a common thing in physics. Generally, in physics, we are interested in the way an object behaves as certain properties change over time. If nothing changes, then nothing really physically interesting is happening. Remember, I told you a couple times before that Albert Einstein says that time uh, is invented to make motion seem simple. Because time is generally the thing that we're going to use as our dependent variable, right? The thing changes depending on time. If velocity in this case was not constant, if velocity is dependent on time as well, now you have a problem because this ratio does not work. Because this V is not a constant. That V is going to be some function of P. The way you have to solve that problem is with calculus. You have to get into something called differential equations to do it. Again, far outside the scope of this course. But because our V is a constant, we could just treat V as one, right? One what? I don't know. One unit. Who cares? I can make up my own unit. And I can say that whatever velocity this thing has has one unit. One squared is just one. So I can basically ignore it. And I can say that as long as V remains constant, then AC is proportional to one over R. If I prove it by setting up this, the R's are going to cancel. So now all I have to do, if I have a problem like this, that says assume one thing is doubled or something else is had or changed by a third or a quarter or whatever you want to do, anytime you see that kind of problem, what happens if something doubles? What happens if something is reduced by a third? Start thinking about ratios and set up these ratio problems. This is a thing 
that I have seen my entire teaching career that people get scared of from an early age, you get scared of fractions. You get scared of ratios. Now is the time to overcome that fear and learn how to use them. Makes this problem trivial. The last piece of this thing. Ah. It's going to be exactly what I was talking about. So, part D. Find the acceleration if angular velocity omega is double. We're going to assume in this case that R is constant. The way this problem is worded is assuming the circle's path does not change. The only thing that would change its path is if the radius changes. So why would that be? Well, that would mean going around a circle that's not a circle anymore. That's got some kind of odd shape to it. Uh, so if you were trying to trace out some closed path that looked like that, well, suddenly radius is not constant. And again, we need differential equations to solve that problem. So we're not going to do that. We're going to assume a constant R. Well, remember that another expression we have for centripetal acceleration is r omega squared, where omega is the angular velocity. So r omega squared. And what do we ask? We want to know what happens to the stroke acceleration if we double the angular velocity. Same kind of trick, right? If we know that AC is R omega. We already know what the angular acceleration is. That's our five meters per second. We know what the radius is, and it's going to be a constant 0 0.03 times omega squared. Well, if we do some algebra here, we'll find that omega is root five over 0 0.03. That's in radians per second. Okay, cool. So what does that mean? If omega gets doubled, just look at this problem here. As omega increases, AC increases. But going to increase by a factor of a square. So that means that if we make omega big, we go to our constant, that AC is going to get big. So we None of these are exceptionally difficult, I don't think. A lot of algebra, a lot of tediousness. But if you notice that everything that we have done has relied on just a couple of equations, and the equations that I gave you at the beginning of this lecture, they are equations that are in your notes, and there are equations that you should be finding as you work through the homeworks. So let's do this one. This looks a little more fun, a little more practical. 
let's say that we have a fighter jet and our fighter jet is going around this turn in our radius of this turn is five and a half kilometers. So pretty big circle, right? And we know that our velocity of this aircraft is Two thousand one hundred and sixty kilometers per hour, going pretty damn fast, right? Now, if I want to maintain that speed, so this is my cat, right? This is my cat running a circle. I want to maintain that speed. We expect, as R gets short, that our acceleration gets big. What we want to know here is what is the acceleration in G's. So it doesn't do me a whole lot of good as a pilot to have to do some conversion in my head and figure out what the G load is uh, as far as meters per second squared. That's hard for me to understand because me caveman be stupid. So I want to think in terms of Gs. I know what one G feels like. So I probably don't want to sustain this if it's going upwards of seven, eight, ten Gs. I've done six in an airplane and it is not fun. Some of these fighter aircraft can get up to nine to 12 Gs, but not for a long time. Uh, well, the aircraft can take five and a half. On a uh, rocket launch, on the Saturn V, for example, that took us to the moon, the maximum acceleration on launch those guys experienced was about five Gs. And on reentry, it can be three to seven Gs, depending on angle of reentry and that kind of thing. So it can get a little uncomfortable. So, anyway, what we want to do is let's find out what the acceleration of this thing is in Gs. So just for reference, one G is our 9.8 meter per second squared. So before we do anything, let's do some unit conversions. We have things in terms of kilometers and hours. That's not gonna work for us because everything we're doing here, remember, is designed to give us things in meters and seconds. So we better start doing some conversion. So quickly, one kilometer per hour, we wanna convert uh, to seconds. Well, one kilometer I know is a thousand meters and an hour I happen to know is 3,600 seconds. You can do the conversion on your own if you like. We can immediately drop a couple of zeros on that. We know they're gonna cancel same order of magnitude. So we get something that's like 10 divided by 36, whatever that works out to be. So the same thing, so that's our uh, kilometers per hour in meters per second. So I need to do, this was for one kilometer per hour, that's 1036 meters per second, but I need to know what 2160 kilometers per hour is. So all I have to do 
is say 2160 times this conversion factor, 10 over 36. And that works out to be 600 meters per second. Right? So now I have a good measurement of my velocity, but no longer in kilometers per hour, it's in meters per second, which is what I need. So I need to know the magnitude of the centrifugal acceleration. So AC is V squared over R. I know what V is. Uh, my V I just found out was 600 meters per second. R is 5.5 kilometers. This should be a conversion you can do in your head. A kilometer is a thousand meters. So 5.5 times a thousand, move the decimal three places, and you get something that looks like 5,500. You know what? I messed up on my thing here, and I don't feel like doing the math. So let's say that's five kilometers. Doesn't matter, right? So what we end up with, don't forget the square, I almost did. So what we end up with, if you work this out, is you get something looks like 72 meters per second squared. Ah, that's my raw acceleration. But remember, I want to know what this is in G's. So if I'm going out for a mission brief for the flight, and flight lead says, hey, uh, we should expect accelerations of 72 meter per second squared in this turn as we roll out on the target. That is meaningless to me. I don't know what to prepare for. That's a hard number to deal with. You came in stupid. I'm pretending I'm a fighter pilot now and not a heavy crew member because we have far more class. Uh, so we need to convert this to G's. Or well, remember the G is just a ratio. So the acceleration due to gravity per G. Well, I know my acceleration due to gravity, or my centripetal acceleration, is 72 meter per second squared. And I know my acceleration due to gravity is 9.8. So that works out to be 7.35 Gs. That's a lot. So let's say that this fighter pilot with all his gear and everything weighs 200 pounds. And he goes into this turn. He is suddenly going to feel like he weighs 200 times 7.3. So that's about a little more than 2,100 pounds. So he's going to feel like he weighs over a ton. A little difficult to fly an airplane when you weigh a ton. Think about trying to fly the aircraft and you need to lift your arm up to hit a switch over the top of your head or you need to reach for something. Let's say your average arm weighs 10 pounds. Well, we can lift our 10 pound arm all day long, right? Not under seven and a half Gs you can't because now my arm weighs 70 pounds. So if you want to know what that feels like next time you go to the gym, if we assume our arm weighs 10, get a 60 pound dumbbell and try to lift it. That's what it's going to feel like to the spider pilot. But it's going to feel like that over his whole body. Now we have a problem, right? The other problem that we have here, this is just a little aside because I like aviation, Here's our fighter pilot. He's sad because he 
be stuck in fighters because the C5 galaxy is way cooler. Uh, so he's stuck in fighters. He's sad. But as we make this turn, not only him, but everything in his body is under the influence of 7.3 Gs. That means all the blood in the guts and all the squishy parts inside him are also going to want to go down or towards the center, right? Because that's how gravity works. So all the blood that was in his head making his little pea brain operate is now in his feet. So he's got a blackout. So in order to fix this problem, we wear what's called a G-suit that squeezes your legs and your abdomen and everything and pushes all the blood back up in your head. And you also have to grunt and squeeze real hard to overcome this. And even that is not enough for sustained periods. A couple of seconds, you could probably do that. A minute or two, you're done. You're gonna pass out. So we gotta be very careful in these turns that if we're gonna go really fast, we've gotta be careful with this radius. Because if your radius is too small, you get incredible G loads coming around. Now, not only is this a problem for the meat inside the machine, might be a problem for the machine too. How much weight can the bolts that hold the wing onto the fuselage take? How much stress can they take? You put too much on them, they're going to separate. You have what's called a rapid unscheduled demolition. So when the entire aircraft comes apart, sometimes we call it a high-speed come apart. Either way, really bad day. I know it's a little outside the scope of the problem, but gives you something to think about and gives you some context into what we're actually measuring with these problems. As I'm sure you have discovered as you work through the homeworks, the it's easy to get lost in the numbers and the mathematics. The point of this class is not to bog you down with numbers and mathematics. The point of this class is to get you to think <clears throat> about what we're going to actually do with this. Think about application. Uh, in uh, some of you guys' courses, some of you I know are in nursing programs and medical programs. It's vital that you understand when you're measuring dosage for a medication, for example, that you can accurately calculate the difference between a one milligram dose and a 10 milligram dose, right? Can make somebody have a really bad day or a really good day, depending on what kind of medication it is, I suppose. So let's do, I think I'll probably do one more here. So Here we have the, the crankshaft of a car propeller engine or something. And that crankshaft is eight centimeters. And it spins at a rate of 2,400 revolutions a minute. So imagine what this looks like, an eight centimeter diameter crankshaft. So it's about 10 centimeters to the inch. So we're talking about a shaft that is less than an inch wide. And if we hit a stopwatch and we put a mark on this thing, every time that mark goes around the top, we're going to tick off some time. So if we measure for a minute, we're going to see 2,400 RPMs. Things are spinning pretty good. I want to know what 
the velocity is at the surface, right? In other words, if that crankshaft kind of has to be come apart, how fast is the piece going to leave that's no longer attached? Seems something useful to know. Well, again, everything we do needs to be in scientific units. Well, revolutions per minute doesn't give me anything. So I need to convert revolutions per minute into something that looks like meters per second. Well, one revolution is the circumference of the circle, right? That was actually the uh, name of King Arthur's fattest knight, circumference. I know it's stupid. Uh, so we need the circle circumference because that's one revolution, right? Go all the way around per minute. Well, I know a minute is 60 seconds. That was an easy one. So what is the circumference? of uh, a circle. You should know this from basic geometry. That's two pi r. There are two pi radians around any circle. Doesn't matter how big the circle is, it's always two pi radians. Well, that's going to be a function of how long the radius is. So it's two pi r. That's my circumference. Well, a little bit of algebra will tell you that this is pi r over 30. So if we want to convert RPMs to meters per second, then all we have to do is multiply our RPM value by the conversion factor of pi r over 30. In this case, we know that our, our angular velocity in RPM is 2400. And we multiply this by pi r over 30. Pi is our ratio of uh, circumference to diameter, which is 3.14159, repeating out to infinity, 3.14 is fine. Plug this into your calculator, and you get something that looks like 20.1 meters per second. Well, what does that tell me? Tells me the answer to the problem. Trivial, right? So 20.1 meters per second. So if I've got this thing spinning at 2,400 RPM and I let go of it, it comes apart and a chunk flies off, that chunk is going to be doing 20 meters per second. So think about how fast that is. You could do the conversion if you like to miles per hour. It's going to be pretty fast, right? Because one meter, a little more than three feet, about 1.6 meters is six feet. So multiply this by roughly two, and you get something that looks like feet per second. So it's about 40 feet per second. This classroom is probably 30 to 40 feet wide. So in one second to go from one wall to the other, that's going pretty damn quick. Probably don't want to get hit by that. In fact, in 
uh, some of the following units. When we start talking about energy, we're going to start talking about something called momentum. And we're going to be able to calculate uh, how bad that would ruin your day. You know what? Let's do let's do one more because this one's a little more interesting. Start to put together some other concepts. So here I've got a circle. And kid sits in a cart. And he's attached to a rope to the center of some circle. And that rope's two meters long. Let's say he weighs 20 kilograms. We got a motor or something that's spinning this card around. And let's say that at some point we measure the tension on this rope and that we find that our tension is 100 newtons. And I want to find the velocity in RPM. So basically what we're going to try to do here is we're going to have to convert meters per second into revolutions per minute. Seems a little difficult with what we have. The clue to solving this problem is to recognize that you were getting tension. Tension is measured in newtons. Thus, it is a force. So anytime we're dealing with forces, we know we're going to need Newton's second law F equals ma. Well, we're dealing with circular motion here. So we probably need to know something about centrifugal force. And that's just going to be mv squared over r, as we know. We need a velocity. So let's do this. Let's solve this algebraically to find V. I'm going to walk through this slowly with algebra steps just to make sure that we get what we're doing. So if we multiply both sides by R, we get something that looks like centrifugal force times R equals mass times square of the velocity. We need to divide through by M. Yes, the square of the velocity. Remember, we got to get rid of the square, so we need a square root. We get FCR over M. Now we can find this velocity pretty easily, right? Look how much time and effort this saves you to do this algebraically just to do it symbolically first before you start plugging numbers in. If you just started from F equals MA, and then you went back here and you tried to work a bunch of crap, plugging numbers in, you're gonna get lost. So think about what you're trying to solve. So we start from principles. We know we're trying to find a velocity. So we need something that has velocity in it. So we do our find that our centrifugal force has velocity in it. Solve for V, that's what we're trying to find. Now we can put numbers in. So V, well, we know our R is our two meters or our square root here. What does the centrifugal force have to be? Since there is no oscillation radially, 
we're going to assume the rope has held. So that means our centrifugal force has to be equal to the tension. Well, we know our tension is 100 newtons. And we know the mass is 20 kilograms. So if we work this out, this works out to be root 10 meters per second. So that's our linear velocity. But that ain't what we want, right? We need it in RPM. We know that velocity, our linear velocity, is the same thing as R times angular velocity. A little bit of algebra tells us that our angular velocity is linear velocity divided by radius. We know our linear velocity is root 10. We know our R is two. And we know this is in radians per second. But we still need RPMs, so we need a conversion factor. We know that one radian per second, a radian is one over two pi revolutions, and a second is one sixtieth of a minute, just a different way to do this. Little bit of algebra. And we got 30 divided by pi RPM. Pi is a little more than three. So that's going to be a little less than 10 RPM. So. Oops, I forgot to multiply that through. Works out to be about 30 RPMs. And just for the sake of argument, let's find out how many Gs he's experiencing. So we know that AC is just V squared over R. Well, I know what my V is. That's 10 meters per second, or root 10. If I square that, I just get rid of the square root. And the R in this case is two meters. So 10 divided by two gives me five meters per second squared. If I want that in Gs, five through by 9.8. It's roughly half a G. So this is probably a fun ride, right? This is not the fighter pilot doing a 7G turn. This is just lazily swinging this card around under an acceleration of half a G. So no big deal. All right. So I think that's probably enough of that for today. Like I said, this was a little bit longer. Uh, due to the problems we had with the interwebs. Uh, on Friday, I will continue on with this. Uh, because I'm a little bit behind, I'm going to extend out the due date on the homeworks. Normally, it would be due Friday at midnight. I'm going to extend that out through the weekend, uh, through Sunday at midnight, uh, because quite honestly, I'm not going to be looking at it this weekend anyway. So if you turn it in at 11.59 on Friday, since I'm not going to look at it until Monday anyway, I, you know, I might as well just extend it. And it gives you a little extra time and it lets me get through some stuff. So that's where I will pick up in the next lecture is we will continue on and try to finish up most of uh, circular motion. Till then, as always, remember, if you have problems, come see me. <laughs>